So this this video is part of a series that's about the future. Sure. Specifically. Uh, do you feel VR and this and AR and all of that that you're working in is the future? Is that where we're, we're heading towards? Or what is its role in the future? Right. So virtual reality, uh, the term has been around for a while now. Um, and so there's always this weird kind of um, mystery of when does the literature and the comic books and the novels kind of inspire the development of real tangible technology and items. Uh, you know, was it Jules Verne who came up with it about the, you know, the tablets that we would all like carry around or, you know, um, you know, Ray Bradbury and all these things that you kind of see coming into fruition. It's always been very interesting to kind of see who's leading who on that and where the true inspiration comes from. Hello, and welcome to Good and Decent, a Grotto podcast. Episode 22, The Future is Freaky. Grotto Network staff looks towards the future and wonders, one of the first things we look at is modern scientific advancement. Scientists and researchers on the forefront of particle acceleration technology, for instance, are able to look at the inner workings of the atom, previously unknown. CERN's Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, swings particles around at crazy speeds crashes them into each other like two trains going the wrong way on the track. Then the researchers study the fallout. It's obviously fascinating, but sometimes it takes another kind of person to help the rest of us realize what it all means to interpret the data. Sometimes we really need someone like an artist or a writer to grasp and understand the technology for themselves. And then for the rest of us predict and extrapolate what may become of it. And that's exactly what Mark Rogers did with his graphic novel, The Blessed Machine. Now that the CERN Collider is uh, operative, uh, they do discover that it, it is true that small little Black holes are literally created that exist just for a nanosecond. A lot of the th things that you think about, you know, like a, you know, a, uh, some sort of a comet hits the surface or climate change, well, those are all have been explored before. Um, so I wanted to explore something where science itself was the inciting incident. So what I wanted to explore was to what extent this kind of utopian instinct we have, or this, this instinct that science will be our savior, um, that that instinct actually became um, our captor. For this particular Grotto story, there's a bit of a challenge. The blessed machine only exists in graphic novel form. So our lead producer on the piece grabbed a couple of voice actors he knows and put them to the task of bringing the text to life in audio form. Here's how the Blessed Machine starts off. A seemingly normal scene is playing out. 
pensive boy at his kitchen table, gnawing at his bowl of cereal, and he's trying to get through to his distracted mother. Jacob. Did people live up there where there were gardens and the sun? Everyone lived up there a long time ago, but then some scientists tried to do a thing. A big, very important thing. It changed the weather all over the world. People couldn't live on the surface anymore. in the effort to break apart the Higgs boson, to kind of open that up, that we actually would be opening up an area that should stay unknowable. The Super Collider is kind of pure science research, you know, in its most extreme form. Um, and the purpose is, you know, to, like a collider, you know, it's to, it's to have elements um, move at such speeds that they actually kind of split, or you can measure smaller and smaller elements to, um, understand some of the mysteries of the universe. One of the elements the, the CERN Collider was expected to discover is the Higgs boson, the God particle. It's, it's the thing that connects matter together and actually gives other matter gravity. Without the Higgs boson, theoretically, all matter would just fly apart and uh, there'd be, you know, there'd be no cohesion, right? It'd become pure chaos. We'll play you one more clip from The Blessed Machine, and this is the scene where it all seems to go wrong. Some sort of government official, probably a president or a prime minister, is making a very important announcement. We have invited you to the Hadron Collider to be a part of history and witness Higgs Fission. The first splitting of the Higgs boson particle. Here in a live feed, we can see the collider less than 50 yards from this very room. To be sure, the Higgs boson isn't a distinct particle. It's more like the space between particles. Its vision could create a field of tiny black holes, which would open up a new frontier in technological application. Any second now... Um... can we know to be true? Is it only the scientific knowledge? And are we dependent upon science itself to understand that, right, truth? Or is there a truth that lives outside of what science can tell us? How the God Particle inspired this comic author is the Grotto Story by Jonathan Rogers. Hello, I'm Josh Long, senior producer for Grotto Network, and I'm here with esteemed video <laughs> freelancer, Jonathan Rogers. Thanks so much Hello. for joining me, kind of on short notice this week. I really appreciate of it. Of course, of course. Yeah, definitely. Excited to be here. I've never done a podcast before, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Our listeners just listen to a story about the God Particle. It's this comic book story. <laughs> you created it. You're the yes. lead producer on that story. How did you manage to find this story subject? Long story short, it was my my father. So, 
so uh, yeah. Is that reverse nepotism? Yeah, I Is that guess how that so, works? yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my dad has done a lot of, he, he's, uh, he's always been into like comics and stuff and grew up with uh, collecting comics and whatnot. And um, yeah, and so he initially had written a, a screenplay uh, he switched it to, uh, you know, he started a little comic publication company and uh, decided to turn it into a graphic novel. Well, we don't do any stories at Grotto without researching the story subject a little bit. Yes. And I also happened to see that he was like a staffer on Capitol Hill yes. for almost two decades. Like, yeah. He's a pretty smart dude. He's done some stuff. <laughs> for sure, for sure, yeah. So he was on Capitol Hill for about, uh, yeah, like 16 years or something. Uh, he was chief of staff for senator. He was he was pretty ready to get out of the, the political world. I, I think that he was, he found, he realized that he was more passionate about, you know, culture. And when he was, when he was in Capitol Hill, he kind of realized that to change our society it doesn't actually come necessarily from politics but it comes from culture so mm. um, kind of politics is downstream from culture so if you want to change cult you if you want to change society you kind of have to start with culture and then that will trickle down into politics yeah you don't normally think of leaving politics for more power yeah <laughs> to go into like movie like producing exactly. and writing like that's kind of backwards from what you normally <laughs> think. But Jonathan, what fascinated you the most about the story about the Hadron Collider? Yeah, Am I saying that yeah, right? Hadron? Hadron Collider. Collider or something. Yeah, I mean, I love... Blessed Machine. The Blessed Machine is the is the name of the um, comic, but, or the graphic novel. But um, I, I mean, I love science fiction. It's built on the premise of Plato's Allegory of the Cave. It's kind of like a similar backstory. So I, I like the taking that template and putting it in a more modern context. You guys just listened to the video, but I think it's uh, an interesting thing. You know, the idea of there's mystery in the world that, you know, sometimes we're not, <laughs> we're not always meant to solve. As humans, we can't solve everything. And sometimes that that pursuit to solve everything can lead to destruction and can lead lead to you know negative consequences um, because some things are meant to be mysterious and um, I mean I'm a big I'm a big C.S. Lewis and Tolkien fan and I always love that kind of mystical side of the world. Yeah, I like that thought that some things should stay a mystery, but there's still a question of like kind of discerning which things those yes. are because some things are worth pursuing oh for completely. sure yeah but, yeah yeah do yeah. you and, and your I... dad ever have talks <laughs> about the god particle or baby black holes or just the future in general every week uh, <laughs> uh i mean occasionally he, he works on a, a wide variety of, of projects so it's always fun to uh to chat about you know certain things that he's working on and the science thing I, yeah i definitely think that you know science is a beautiful way to explore and to um to you know learn a, a, learn about a lot of different topics and i i don't think that it's like you know you shouldn't go into science and stuff but i i really think oh, sure. that <laughs> that uh there is there's so much out there and you can explore so many things but you know underneath that there's there's a mystery to our life and our existence that we, you know, we can never solve um, on our own. So totally. Well, at Grotto this month, we're doing this edition. We're just calling it the future. I really tried to put my neck out there for it to be called the future is freaky. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it didn't take with the team. So that's not what we're calling the edition. But uh, Jonathan, do you think the future is freaky, especially having just just reminiscing about the Blessed Machine story. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that there there is going to be, <laughs> I think it's a little freaky for sure. I mean, 
I think the, uh, especially with a lot of AI stuff right now, I know that's a big topic on everyone's mind and especially creatives minds. I think it's, it's definitely a mixed bag, but I think it's, I think it's going to be a really interesting, you know, interesting tool. And I'm curious to see uh, the ways that we both utilize it for good and the ways that it'll, you know, uh, be a detriment to society. Um, so, and, you know, with the blessed machine, it obviously has a, uh, a warning out there for relying too heavily on it. Well, a lot of technology in this good and decent episode started people off with this massive super collider in Switzerland and like also in the mind of your dad. <laughs> it was where that story led us. Yes. And then talking about AI here a little bit. And right after this conversation, we had Ronald Short, another video producer, sit down with JJ mm -hmm. Castillo in Austin, Texas, and ask him about his VR business, Viewer Ready. So he's got an awesome outlook on the creativity and what the future of VR is. And we'll get to that in just a yeah. second. But Jonathan, you ever been in a VR machine? You got any experience? Oh, yes, yes. My dad, even though he's uh, he wrote the Blessed or Blessed Machine and, you know, is, 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 has always been the technological <laughs> wizard in the family. So uh, he got me an Oculus at one point. So I've, I've definitely <laughs> engaged in that for sure. So it's pretty crazy. It's pretty cool what it can do. Give me one favorite memory. Something JJ talks about is like how the memory retention is ridiculous. Like you can remember more because you're kind of inside of it. Do you have In yeah. do you have a moment where that just really sticks <laughs> out to you? Yeah, I mean, I I'm a I'm a Star Wars fan, so there is uh, <laughs> the Star Wars VR game. Um, of course, and I think for the majority of the game, you have a blaster, but there's this one like you know you get like you access like this distant memory story and you you get a wheel of lightsaber and it's Let's go. it's pretty awesome <laughs> it, it was uh yeah it was one of the cooler cooler vr moments for sure i was i was into it so <laughs> that is perfect all right i will let yes. ronald take it from here and uh we'll see you on the flip side jonathan it was great talking with you today yes well thank you guys so much for having me appreciate it all right have a good one you too Hey there, um, I'm JJ Castillo, and I own uh, View Ready, which is an XR and media studio. My background into getting into like the VR, AR industry is very odd. It's not the kind of traditional uh, path. Uh, I was a filmmaker. I was working at Rooster Teeth Studios. Very, very happy. Uh, very nice, cush, like you know, kind of production gig. Uh, but uh, around 2015 or so, I was building my first PC, and I got an ad for um, the Oculus Dev Kit, and it was only $300. I just had my uh, kind of my Christmas bonus, so I had some money burning in a hole in my pocket. And I said, Yeah, why not? Let's do it. I'm going to check this thing out. It sounds like it'd be fun. And uh, you know, the moment I put it on, I kind of had this holy calling experience. I was, uh, I was doing the very famous Tuscany demo that was uh, made by Palmer Lucky. It was kind of the first iteration of what an Oculus demo could be. And I was listening to like a David Bowie Spotify list and it just, everything just kind of, you know, hit at once. And uh, I, 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 at that moment, I kind of re realized how obsessed and um, kind of, um, I just couldn't stop thinking about it. You know, I, I love movies uh, my whole life, but I'd never stayed up an entire night until the sun came up staring at the ceiling thinking about what you could do with VR and cameras and, uh, you know, just what we could bring to a new medium. It, it's, it was essentially like finding out a new color existed in the year 2015. It was 2015 and when I had that holy moment in VR, you know, I, I, I kind of just left an entire career and in industry and started 
you know, knew. I, I, I had a reputation and, and, and you know, a certain, um, I had a, I had a career and a history of work in filmmaking. I could go to film festivals and those meetups and I knew who, I, I knew people and it was a whole thing that I'd, I'd built up over, you know, over a decade of work. And I kind of, at the time, just kind of trashed it completely to start working in VR, which was this brand new thing. I'd never worked in video game engines. You know, at the time, as a filmmaker, I wasn't even that wild about doing stuff on green screens. So the idea of, of kind of diving in into this, you know, world that is code and animation and modeling was, you know, so daunting. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, um, it, it, it was really exciting because for me, as a filmmaker coming from film, everything that I ever wanted to do with a camera and an edit had kind of already been done before. You know, sometimes I would do stuff as a teen with a camera and I'd attach a tripod to me with, you know, a bunch of straps and I'd run around and be like, I invented this, you know? And then, I, and then I'd see like a scene from Mean Streets from Scorsese, like in the 70s, and the shot would be in the movie and I'd be like, oh, it's all been done before. Uh, but with VR, it was kind of like this, you know, Oscar Wilde, Stanley Kubrick, uh, Orson Welles kind of moment where there wasn't a class for this, there wasn't a book for this, this was your time to kind of come in when things were still kind of Play-Doh and really make a dent and try things out, try formatting videos differently, try doing different things with UI and inventory and interactions uh, and really lean into the, the, the immersiveness of it all. And, and what was so exciting about that time was that you know, certain things did leave an imprint and certain things people do bring to games in the future and say, well, you know, so-and-so did this, so, so, so now we do this, which is really reminiscent of kind of like early filmmaking in the Lumiere Brother days where like it was some guy just somewhere that thought, I want to put a camera right here, and then that became a standard. And at the time, he just liked the way it looked. So it was a, it was a really exciting time. Um, and there wasn't a lot of people in the 2015, 2016 time frame that were really dipping their toes into it. So it was, a, it was a time where you could kind of make yourself someone in industry that has value very quickly. Nice. So you're, you're a pioneer is what you're saying. <laughs> I'm a pioneer. Uh, I, I will say that I never thought I would be alive during the birth of a new medium. You know, I kind of thought they had all been they'd all come and gone, you know, radio, television, film, uh, they'd all been cracked and we'd all just been kind of, you know, recycling the, the lessons we learned over time. So when virtual reality came out and, and this new iteration, the, you know, the development kit from early Oculus pre-Facebook and then even the DK2, which is kind of where I started playing around with it. The DK2 had a, it had like a webcam that you would stick on your monitor and that knew where your head was. So now you could actually move around, up and down, side and side, whereas before it, it had been kind of just like a snow globe on your head. You don't try to be a pioneer, but at the time it's just, I just don't understand why everyone didn't drop what they were doing and then whatever career and history they were and then just run at virtual reality with this brand new medium. It was kind of like the gold rush. And I can imagine people running out to like go sift for gold in these, in these rivers. We're like, why isn't everyone doing this? It's like, it's, it's such an exciting time. Can you tell me specifically about your company, Viewer Ready? Sure. So, uh, you know, Viewer Ready uh, was founded around 2016. We incorporated in 2017. Our first, like, little success was we were at a game jam, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we made a game where, you know, you have, uh, you know, like a cylinder and a sphere, and you had some colliders and some multipliers, and it's, you, you make a baseball game. But it was like a self-pitch baseball game where you had to throw the ball up yourself and then hit it, um, but the field was covered with you know, like vases and windows and plates and you would just try to smash all the, as much stuff as possible. Um, and then so we did that and become a very popular like free game on Steam. Back then there was only like 12 or 15 games that you could use with the Vive on Steam. So if you had one and it was free, it was getting like 100,000 downloads just because people wanted to show what the headset could do and the, there was a total lack of content. Uh, but uh, so we did that and then one of my devs at the time said, um, so we said that and then uh, one, of, one of my staff said, wouldn't it be interesting if, wouldn't it be cool if we made a prediction script that would let you know where the ball's gonna land so that way when you hit the ball, you teleport to the outfield and you're in a five foot radius of where the ball is gonna be and you have to kind of strategically go catch it. 
And I was like, that's, that's a great idea. So, so we made that and it was popular. And then we realized we were essentially making a full, a full baseball game at that point. Like we were kind of putting in the early work on it. Um, and then so what was interesting is that there was, we were only like three guys, we were only like three people making, making a game in my townhouse. And I really thought with all this competition, with the EAs, with all these other studios, with large amounts of investment, and we're totally just bootstrapping and doing this ourselves, it still blows my mind that we are the first um, studio to release a full-fledged virtual reality baseball game. Not like a home run derby where it's just like a bunch of mini games, but a real, you can be everyone on the field, you can play multiplayer, you can play single player, you can do full campaigns. Um, I would say it took about nine months to a year just to get those state machines AI in place so that the game functions with or without a player on the field. And that sole reason is why I can understand why bigger studios might be hesitant to put the time in. Um, because it's a, you know, I think we were, we were working on the game and just the AI for about two years before we released it. So, you know, it was, a, it was, it was a, a bit of a money pit for about two years. You'd be like, we're not making any money off of this, but let's keep going in that direction. So after that, we're working on a, uh, a follow-up to Totally Baseball, which will be Totally Basketball. Um, so that's a really uh, exciting thing that we're working on that you should see at some point next year. Awesome, congratulations, that's great. Um, so this, this video is a part of a series that's about the future, sure. specifically. Uh, do you feel VR and this and AR and all of that that you're working in is the future? Is that where we're, we're heading towards? I, I, I think that, I think we're already aged out. I think that the people that are our age playing the VR and AR games and going out and buying those things that are age, they're, they're the equivalent of uh, PC gamers in the 80s. Uh, early, super passionate about it, really hard to kind of explain to other people why it's, it's a big deal. So there's a general unrest in the industry where everyone's saying, everyone's kind of like, where's the killer app? You know, why can't these games be more uh, popular with, you know, with gamers? And I'm saying you're looking at the wrong demographics. Like if you think that even 20 year olds, if you think 20, 30 plus year olds, 30, let's look at 30 year olds. If you think 30 year olds who have been playing video games for 20 years, sitting down at a controller are gonna be thrilled about changing that routine, it's just not gonna happen. They've, they're too trained, they're, they're, they're too set in their old ways and that's fine, it's totally fine. What you gotta look at is the, like, the 10 to 13 year olds. So I remember I went to super like south rural Texas to visit um, my family a couple years back. I took a Oculus Rift with my laptop and I figured all the teenagers would be like stoked about playing like super hot and all these games. And they were into it a little bit. I think they were more worried about looking nerdy. You know, like it was like it was awkward for them. But it was the 10 year olds and the 13 year olds that would come up to me and be like, do you have Richie's Plank Experience? Do you have uh, Job Simulator? Do you have all, like they knew the titles. They were so passionate about it. A generation, I think that the 10 to 13 year olds of the, of the future will see 2D gaming the same way that we see black and white shows or like MASH on TV. Like it just seems dated and kind of boring. And so, I mean, I think 2D games will always be a thing but I think the generations that are young right now are gonna grow up playing these games in the headsets with their friends, and they're always gonna be wanting to do that. And so we're building the games for the generation of tomorrow. I'm very well aware that the ideas in my head for virtual reality, augmented reality, um, you know, I'll be a lot older when they're in place and like super slick. We're making the pavement. We're putting down the railroad tracks right now, and someone has to, and like, I'm thrilled to be doing it. Uh, there's a lot of people that are saying like they want, they want that moment to happen faster. They want that future now. And I'm just, I'm just thrilled to be part of the ride. And, and, you know, and hopefully in the future, you know, we get a little cred as like, oh, you know, when it comes to sports games, like these guys, these guys did something real special. And I, making money is cool, sure, but I love living in, uh, I love living in people's heads rent free with nostalgia. You know, like whether it's a certain song from our game or a certain sound effect or a certain like time period in these kids' lives where five to six years from now, like a certain thing will trigger it and they'll be like, man, remember that summer where we just played totally baseball like all summer? Like that to me is, is the sweet spot. And, and there's something really magical about 
making virtual reality because you're so immersed in it that when you remember it, it's almost like remembering a dream because you were really there. So the memories are just crazy solid compared to, you know, non-virtual reality memories. Sure. So View Ready's goals for the future are just to keep growing uh, and creep. I have a pretty big idea for a non-sports VR game. It's very narrative driven. It's, it's like you, I took every mechanic from climbing and running and all these different games that I'd played in demos over the years and I kind of housed them in this one narrative experience. Um, and it, there's, there's elements, um, there also there's, there's gaming elements and puzzle elements, but there's also this whole narrative going on that um, is, 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 is just happening in the background. And, and if you listen to it, if you catch little bits of it, it actually help you along and there's a lot of great little Easter eggs. But I'm really excited about it because the storyline in the background I want to do with full mocap, facial mocap rigs, like, you know, movement rigs with multiple actors. And so uh, it'll be a little bit of a merging of kind of like filmmaking, capturing, and then the gaming aspect. It, 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 I feel like it's going to incorporate all the things I've learned from all the industries I've worked in. Um, and I, I'm very, very excited about bringing that um, into fruition. Oh, yeah, that sounds awesome. Do you have any advice for people interested in getting into this world? Sure. For anyone who's interested in working in XR, green screen development, uh, 3D animation, uh, you know, hologram capture, um, I would just say just start, you know, uh, just, just, just go to a game jam if you want to game, if you want to get into game dev, just go to a game jam, uh, you know, sit and listen. Um, try to absorb as much as you can. Working in a video game engine, when you've never worked in a video game engine, it can be really intimidating. Um, I never understood why so many developers wear flip-flops um, until I started working in the Unity engine. It's because when things aren't working, um, everything is real tight. <laughs> everything gets like, you're like, oh, I feel like my shoes are real tight right now. And it, it can be really aggravating. Uh, but stick, stick with it, you know, watch those YouTube tutorials, and what you'll realize is that by week two, you'll start to kind of remember some of the stuff that you're having problems with. And then by like month two, you start to feel really confident in your capabilities and what you can do. And it's just about starting. It's gonna be real hard at first, but you know, every day um, putting the time in will just get easier and easier. Um, so the most important thing to do is, is just start. Um, that would be that would be my advice. This has been great. But, uh, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Anything you'd like to leave? Any note? Um, I would say if you're going to be working in the immersive industry, be weird. Try things out. Uh, don't. Don't. <laughs> okay. If you're working in any industry, whether it's creative or. or Whatever industry you're working in, filmmaking, game dev, fashion, whatever, don't, don't, beware of the clicks, right? There's always going to be clicks of people that have been there before you that are always going to act like you shouldn't be there or you're not as good as them. Don't let that bother you. They're in every single industry, right? And like, but just stay focused, do what you want to do. And if it works, all those people are going to act like they're your friend the whole time. And so I would just say, wear, sometimes you just got to wear blinders. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. Don't let other people's success throw you off. Just stay, stay focused and, 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 and don't give up, especially if it's something that you really believe in. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, buddy. No, no problem. Breaking Boundaries, The Exciting Future of VR Innovation is a Grotto Story by Ronald Short.
Grotto Network is Javi Zubi Zaretta, Director Josh Long, Senior Video Producer Jesse McCartney, Senior Content Editor Kira Kenjujetsky, Project Manager Michaela Douglas, Digital Content Strategist Becky Rogers, Art Director Kevin DeClute, Video Producer Adrian Garaldi, Social Media Manager Mike Rossetti, Senior Manager for Community Engagement Jane O'Connor, Associate Video Producer Father Brendan McAleer, Associate Video Producer Ebony Moxie, Audio Storytelling Associate Jackie Cho, Platform Storytelling Associate Ryan Brossard, Student Media Assistant 